Well, welcome everyone. It's a special day, 90th birthday, and we have a special speaker to go with today, Diane Chakrabarti. Yes. Uh, we should say Dr. Diane Chakrabarti. Now, Diane uh, works as a psychiatrist and uh, has taken off a bit of time. He's due, as soon as this meeting is over, he'll be preparing to go up to Preston, so he's come down. We're very lucky to have him with us today to give, um, to give this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Honourable President, and ladies and gentlemen, friends in the Dharma. It's very nice to see you. I recognise some of you from before. Thank you. It's very kind of you to give up your Saturday mornings and come here. Um, as our president just has mentioned, this is a very special day for us at the Society. It's our 90th anniversary. I believe we're the oldest Buddhist society in the West. So it's really a great day for us. Um, we take it for granted nowadays. We have a lovely premises here. We have freedom to practice. We have the Dharma. We have all the different schools represented to reflect our different personalities. But it wasn't like that 90 years ago. So the first biggest debt of gratitude goes to our founder, Christmas Humphreys. Um, if you think about it, in those days, uh, an educated, cultured man who was into anything Oriental was, was regarded quite weirdly, um, perhaps into the occult or all kinds of. And so these early pioneers, they, they, they fought a lot of social prejudice and whatever, um, sometimes even ridicule, um, to, 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 to lay the seeds for us to, to be able to practice here today. And if you actually look at quite a lot of the early texts of Buddhism translated by Western scholars, um, invariably some of it was painted in a rather negative way, um, cynical sort of nihilistic aspect of Buddhism almost. And it was up to these early pioneers, um, the Christmas Humphreys, the Konzers, the Eric Cheatham's and various other people and, you know, on, on the, who, who corrected that uh, and here we are today. And also, we, 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 we are grateful to our patron, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and, and also to all the various masters from all the different traditions who have blessed us and who have passed through our noble premises. You know, I mean, I remember when I first walked into this place many, many years ago, uh, straight away I, I felt an aura. And I had been to other places before, but it just was missing. Uh, and I knew straight away something in the heart said straight away, this is the place because it's all above board. Um, there isn't any of this kind of superficial coverings of the East. You know, a lot of places you go to, they copy the form and the culture, but the actual essence is missing. And here it's actually quite the other way around. It's the essence, the heart that is here. Uh, otherwise, we're just normal, ordinary people going about our daily businesses. So, with that get of debt of gratitude, I would like to go into uh, today's talk, Seeds of Content. Um, it's a mixture, the, the, there are a few anecdotes, a few examples from personal life, daily life. Um, I think it's important that whatever we learn in the text, we match it up with our own practice and see how, how it relates. Otherwise, it all tends to get in the head and it's not through our own living experience. Otherwise it doesn't really go anywhere. So I'd like to start off a little bit about awareness, which is the foundation of Buddhism, which is the foundation of anything, um, any spiritual tradition or even ordinary daily life. If we're heedless, if we're not aware of what is going on, um, you don't have to be particularly spiritual, it doesn't actually do much good. And you see a lot of heedlessness and lack of awareness out there in society at large and we can see the consequences of that all around us. So the first thing to start off with is this concept that many people find very difficult to handle, this concept of anatta, this concept of no I. Um, it's also in, in the northern tradition of Buddhism, it, it is referred to as perhaps emptiness. But when we first come into it, it, it really 
it really sort of hits us, this thing. And it was quite revolutionary when the Buddha um, mentioned this, because at the time in India, the, 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 the predominant religion, the Brahmanical religion, Hinduism, they used to talk a lot about the Atman, and as if it was some permanent entity that goes on from life to life, uh, and that kind of can cause a lot of problems. So hence it was quite a revolutionary thing, and awareness is really a naked, basic consciousness that is always there. But what usually happens is the sensory data that is coming in, as one is listening right now, we tend to superimpose it with our own perceptions, thoughts, oh I like this, oh this is okay, oh this is boring, when is it going to end, that kind of thing. So the sensory data are coming in, but rather than dealing with things as they are and going with the flow, we tend to superimpose and put our own prejudices, biases, worries, anxieties, opinions, and then you have the feelings and emotions that come in, and it all tends to cloud that basic direct seeing, the naked awareness, which um, I think one of um, a great um, teacher in the past, Krishnamurti, he used to call the, the choiceless awareness, which is a good way of looking at it. But an example I can give is, for instance, worrying, anxiety. Um, you've done so, you, maybe you're going to do something, maybe you're going for a job interview or whatever. You know you are good. You know you have all the qualifications. You've done it many times before. But nevertheless, some pe many people get very nervous. Not just a job interview situation, but many situations. Even actually, people develop anxiety states, panic states, over very trivial things. And it doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. And it, what happens is, we all have a healthy requirement of worrying anxiety. It's, it's evolutionary, we need it for survival. It's called the old fight or flight reaction. But we don't live in jungles anymore. We don't bump into tigers and lions just around the corner. So that evolutionary anxiety has remained with us to some extent. And it's useful in a certain healthy dose because if I've got an exam or something, I do need to prepare for it. But if we overdo it and we start indulging in it and we're not careful and the awareness is not there, it becomes a habit and it becomes almost an unconscious driving force which eventually takes us over. And then pretty soon we become nervous wrecks. And we've all experienced it. You're getting worried about something. You tell yourself, no, stop it, don't worry. I've done this before, it's not a big deal. Um, but nevertheless, it runs on for a while. And that's because there's a deep emotional charge that's firing it. You know, just saying to myself doesn't quite often work. But with the practice of awareness, rather than allowing ourselves to indulge in that negative state, we actually stop it and awareness just sees it as it is and then we give ourselves back to what we're doing, whatever that may happen to be, we, whether it's polishing the table or seeing a client or talking to a friend. You know, so often we see somebody and we might even say, you meet somebody, a colleague at work and you know, you might, you might say good morning, but in your heart, it's not really good morning. You might be thinking about, he said so-and-so to me the other day, and while you are saying good morning, all that is being replayed. He said so-and-so to me the other day, he shouldn't have. You might, you, you might not even say good morning to, to that person that day. Or the converse, you're walking past, your boss, he's lost in his own world, and or she's had a bad day or whatever and she doesn't say good morning to you and then you start a camera roll in your own head oh my god what have i done did i upset her oh no and you know what i mean it goes on and on and on and that's what stress is and that's what dukkha is that's what the dis dis 
ease, this hyphen ease of the heart is. And that's the price we pay. And it builds up, and it builds up, and it goes on for days and days. And eventually we develop all kinds of psychological conditions, and then it starts affecting our body, and then we start complaining, and then we start going seeing lots of different specialists who might give us lots of different drugs, and the whole thing just goes on, and, and, and it's all around us. So we don't lay, we don't put down seeds of discontent, we, we put down seeds of content. And to me, one of the best sort of ways of describing anatta or emptiness is simply this. Give, I give myself into what is here now, and in the doing, I give myself away. And if that is truly done, who is there left to observe or comment or get worried? If there's a going with the flow, what happens then? And I'm sure we've experienced this in our ordinary daily lives, Many a times, quite often, we experience this when we do something that we really enjoy and we're totally given into it. And then suddenly we come back to ourselves, gosh, what's that? So these moments of no I, where there is just the pure flowing, the pure giving myself over, it also actually produces a lot of joy because when we are resisting, pushing, shoving, that resistance itself causes more problem. So, I mean, there's a beautiful um, poem from the uh, Chinese Zen tradition. It's called Faith on Faith in the Heart. And it starts off, the first two lines are quite profound. It, it, it starts off saying, the great way is simple. It simply avoids picking and choosing. And, and that's what our human condition is. We do have to do certain things every day that is not up to our liking. We all have to do it, whether it's washing up the dishes or cleaning the, the toilets or making that horrible phone call to the boss or dealing with that nasty customer. We have to do these things every day, but that's our daily duties and we give ourselves to it. And from my own experience, I can tell you, I mean, I have patients, uh, some I like, some I don't, some give me a horrible time. And it's interesting, you, you, you look at somebody outside your clinic door, they're waiting there in the waiting room, and uh, you see your clinic list and you see, see so-and-so's name and you go, God, here we go again. So I brace myself and um, I usually have little, little, little tools, little tips in my um, office desk, you know, hidden away beside the computer, I have little stickers, you know, a little S for silence, a little Y for yes, a little G for give yourself. And you know, little stickers hidden away. And when I'm with the patient and things are happening and uncomfortable, because sometimes people, you know, we have technical terms for it in psychoanalysis or psychiatry, but they project things onto you, not necessarily intentionally, but that people are suffering, and quite often you do take it out on the therapist, as my friend Desmond here will also testify to, and, and feelings arise in oneself. But the important thing is to be aware of one's own internal state. So while we're dealing with things, we stay at the source level. Yes, the contents of consciousness are important, but the source, so it is important to be aware of both the mind, the chitta, the heart, with all its emotions, feelings, internal states, and the contents, which is what we, how we communicate with each other. So there's those two aspects to consciousness, the source and the contents. And if one stays at the source level, then one isn't straying too far from home. And so I see this patient and immediate reactions, and these things change with daily practice. Eventually, um, one, 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 one treats all equally, and, and, and these uncomfortable feelings do disappear because we develop the confidence to deal with these the uncomfortable situations and pressures. So, I may have these initial difficult ideas, opinions, but then 
the patient comes in or your client comes in or whatever and you give yourself into the situation and yes initially it might be difficult and then something strange happens even though it's a very difficult scenario you still find something shifts genuinely if it's genuine something shifts and the load is a lot lighter the point is if I and my opinions get out of the way, the ride is a lot smoother. I forget who it was, but um, somebody, I think it might have been the great mythologist Joseph Campbell who said, you know, if we don't go along willingly, the gods will drag us along. And that's quite painful. So this giving myself into what is here now, the, 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 at the moment, whatever that demands of us, and going with the flow, it clearly isn't easy. And that is the heart and soul of the practice. Yes, of course there is meditation. But when we actually sit on the cushion, it's also the same thing. Giving myself into the breath, or giving myself into the chant or the mantra, or the Theravadins might use the word Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. And the Tibetans do their things, the Zen people do their thing, you know. But whatever, whatever our focus is, it's actually, the essence of it is giving myself into that. And I think one of the mistakes, and certainly I'm, I, 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 I too, for many years, when I started the practice, you know, we do think that meditation is, is what it's all about. And the formal sitting is, you know, and sometimes we can overdo it. But we forget that actually every act that we do, every moment is a meditative act. Uh, and, and that, is equally uh, as important, perhaps more important, because you know our normal daily lives. We spend a lot more time doing the normal daily events of life: driving, washing, talking, reading, writing, rather than sitting on the cushion. And it's interesting that um, doctrinally you have the six paramitas. Uh, the paramitas means qualities that go beyond, going beyond, going, referring again to the other shore. This shore there is I with my little problems and prejudices and then there is the going beyond to the other shore which is the, the realm of Buddhahood where these noble qualities arise. And the first parameter, oddly enough, is dana. The Sanskrit word is dana which is giving. So it's Interesting, isn't it, that the very start, the very first thing, it starts with giving. And obviously this giving is not very easy, because when something is really pe pressure, pressurised, stressful, I really don't want to do it, um, it it's really you know, crossing all my red lines, it's, it's not easy to give then, is it? It's much easier to back off and, not today, no, I've done too much. I'm really tired, I've had enough, that kind of thing. And that's when other qualities come into it. And that's where the second parameter, Shila, which is discipline, restraint, not very popular words nowadays, discipline, restraint, it's all about me and letting it all hang out and doing what I like. Explosive emotional release, whatever, at the expense of others. So restraint is, 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 is another absolute cornerstone of practice because the awareness is there, but it's no good just having the awareness and then doing nothing about it. I might be aware that I shouldn't do this, this is very bad for me, but then I go off and do it anyway. Um, so the restraint is what comes in next. And that again is very painful and I'm sure you've all experienced states where you know you really had to do something which you really didn't want to do and it's uh, back to picking and choosing uh, aversion all those things but for that because it's uh, it, it, it takes a long time um, and, and doctrinally it is mentioned that the training is in various stages. One of the first stages is, is called the preparatory equipment. The technical Sanskrit term is 
Kushalamula, which is laying down the roots, laying down the good seeds. And that can take a long, long time. Doctrinally, it is said that the Buddha spent many a lifetime while he was the Bodhisattva laying down these good roots. And, okay, we don't have to think about many lives, but looking at our own life, we can jolly well see that issues that bugged me 30 years ago, I might have been in the training for 25 years, but those issues are still bugging me. And I might have gone to many a retreat, and I thought, phew, that one I've dealt with. And then one day, suddenly from nowhere, a pop up comes it again. And you think, gosh, 30 years, and still the roots of I, and the roots of I are very deep. They really go down to the abyss. I mean, after 10 years of training, I realized the size of the operation. And I think 10 years of training taught me simply this, oh my gosh, it is truly a vast abyss. And it is endless, this training, and endless. But many people get disillusioned at that stage. It's too much for me. I'm not a Buddha. I could never be. I could never sit under the bow tree and say, right, either I die or I get it. I, you know, I mean, I've tried. I've tried. You know, I've tried sitting all night on my own and, and whatnot. And <laughs> it's very difficult. And that's where the next paramita comes in: patient endurance, shanti in. Not, not Shanti, but K-S-H-A-N-T-I, Shanti, patient endurance. And that patient endurance to just sit there, yes, I have fallen into this hole yet again, but I will get up and I will walk. Look at the little baby, um, uh, you know, a six-month, one-year-old baby trying to learn, learning to walk. I mean, it falls over, it might hurt itself, it might give a little shriek and a yell, and then up it's again, clambering. And it falls over again, and up it, up it gets again. And we did that. We all did that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here walking. And we have that ability within us. So we need to have that faith upon ourselves that that inner strength is there. I think it was Nelson Mandela who said, Lord, it isn't that I am weak. Actually, I am very strong. And let me be, not be scared that I am strong, because then I have really failed myself. It's very powerful. Because most of us, I mean, we, we take one or two various what we call psychological defense mechanisms. We can be the bully at work, the arrogant one at work, or we can be the humble, I couldn't possibly do that. You know, there's all these different approaches, and neither of them are helpful. So we have patient endurance, and that is really um, the example I like best is like the ox of the buffalo going round and round and round and a paddy field in, in, in Southeast Asia somewhere. Round and round. The mosquitoes are there. The mud is there. It's horrible. It stinks. But it goes round and round and round. And same with us. Thankfully, however, it isn't that bad with us. I mean, most, a lot of the time, especially us here in the West, in London, it isn't that bad. It's actually quite a good, cushy life we have. Um, you know, it, it, we like to complain about our situation at work. He said so and so. Oh, I've got to stay an extra half an hour and finish this off. Well, go round and round. And, and, and I, you know, I, I grew up in the villages in India, so I, I come from a, an old farming family. And, you know, when you go round and round and round, it's not pleasant in that tropical heat. You know, it's physically demanding. So patient endurance. And the other thing that is automatically implied in that is the fourth parameter, which is virya, which is energy, energy. And this energy is, is, is not eye-driven, bullish, arrogant, you know, the business executive who forces his way through people and, you know, bulldozes everything in his way. Not that energy. Again, this is, this is that supreme energy where it is not I who, who say, I must do this, because that can be quite dangerous. And we see many people in the spiritual traditions who have a lot of energy, but it's really the wrong kind of energy. It isn't that humble, you know, the humble, sincere, head-bowed, 
energy. And we see that in the life of the Buddha. And we see that with, with all these great masters that we have had access to here at the Buddhist Society. We've seen many masters here. We see the Dalai Lama at his you know, elderly age still going around trying to help people. So many masters, despite their physical problems, they still give, give, give all the time. So that energy is also important. And these are the preparatory stages of the training. This is the very preparatory. When you read the sutras and scriptures by the original Buddhist masters from India and China and Japan, um, they talk about other things, but they don't necessarily talk about these basic things because they took it for granted from their disciples. I mean, you were not allowed to train in a monastery until you did your pre-training, and that could take seven, eight years. And the pre-training was actually simply sweeping the temple courtyard, washing the dishes, and doing menial jobs, menial jobs. You weren't even allowed to meditate. You weren't even considered all that. But of course here things are different and uh, I want to meditate or in the Zen tradition I want my koan or I want elevated, I want to be elevated as, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama says in the West we want things very quickly, very cheaply and as easily as possible. And the point I'm making is that this is the beginning of the spiritual life when one becomes gentle, a decent human being. And that's not specific to Buddhism, that's specific to all religions or no religion. Even people who are atheists would say that to be compassionate, to be thoughtful of others, uh, to be selfless is a noble thing. And it, it, it's a virtue in all cultures. So that's where, when that has been settled into, and that takes many years of training, and as I mentioned, it can take bitter training, that's when things start happening and an example I'd give about awareness um, I don't know how many of you are drivers but you're driving something happens somebody blows a horn at you somebody cuts you up and off goes the chain reaction and all oh, these buffoons these fools how they're allowed you know all the reactions that you go into and it's quite dangerous actually because you can get so het up about it you will end up having an accident and so as soon as all this is caught in awareness, straight back to the driving, with a vigorous jolt almost, back to the steering wheel, back to the sensation of the feet pressing the pedal, back to the sensation, back to the noises, back to whatever there is, again and again and again. And these kind of practices, this kind of actual practice rather than reading something in a book, because you know, the truth is, uh, however wonderful and sublime in the pages of whatever wonderful book, it, it, it's very uplifting. But then when it comes to actually, you know, I mean, it's happened to me once. I, I gave a lovely talk once and, and it felt wonderful and went to Victoria Station and um, the, the, there was some mess up. I think there was some bomb hoax or something and the station was closed and there was a massive uh, uh, queue of people and, oh God, why does it have to happen today? This kind of thing, you know, it happens all the time and, and we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful. Things can pop up even after 20 years. So this is how we lay down the seeds of content, you know, because what our karma is going to give us next moment, we don't know. What mental state is going to afflict me in five minutes, I don't know. None of us knows. In Sanskrit, we call it parabdha karma, the karma that has come from the past. But then there is the momentary karma, how I deal with what has come up. That's intentional volitional activity at this moment. And that is, that is what leads to further karma. So, and this is something that um, is actually a very useful training tool. This is um, Bodhidharma the founder of Zen, the, the Indian monk who went to China with, with the message of the Zen sort of tradition. Um, well, he mentions this as a powerful training tool, working with karma. What that means is, if something negative comes up, I say to myself, well, it has come up. It is my karma. Let me not make it worse and add more negativity to it. Let me work with it. 
If something positive comes up, let's not get too carried away with it and blow all my squandered inheritance on whatever. <laughs> Let me say to myself, well, it's karma. It can go any moment. Let me not get carried away by it. Let me not get distracted by something positive. Let me enjoy it, but let me not get totally carried away by it. And so we, we work with the head and the tail of karma. That's one, one thing. Um, on, on, on this thing, theme about practice, I just want to mention one of my great heroes, Ajahn Chah, who, who's a um, very famous uh, Theravadin forest monk. He revived the ancient Indian tradition of the forest monks and Buddha, Lord Buddha himself was, was a forest monk, um, a traveling wanderer. And Ajahn Chah in, in Thailand, um, he, he, he revitalized that. His master was Ajahn Moon. And Ajahn Chah's disciple, some of you will know very well, is the Venerable Sumedho, who was instrumental in setting up um, Amaravati Monastery, Chittas Monastery. Um, he's back in Thailand now. But um, Ajahn Chah used to use a phrase called daring to practice daring to practice. None of this wishy-washy, you know, someday hobby, I'll go for a little sitting, I'll do a bit of reading. But he said, if you're really serious, you dare to practice. And the example he gives is, um, when he was a young monk, he felt he had a lot of fear in him. So his dream was to go and spend a night in a burial ground alone. And there, they bring in the bodies, uh, in, in, the, in Asia, as you know, um, the, 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 you, know, you, you set up a funeral pyre, you put the body on, and it takes about 10, 12 hours. And the idea is, and Buddhist monks have, have all over Asia have done it through, through the millennia, you go alone to a burial ground. Um, it's obviously a very scary place. I had been to a burial ground. I lasted about three hours, and then I sort of, and I went with a friend as well. So anyway, Ajahn Chah went went um, to to the burial ground with with another monk, and they decided to sit sort of, you know, a quarter of a mile apart. They didn't want to sit because otherwise it defeats the whole objective, and 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 this, you know, this incredible fear starts arising. I mean, I'm talking about elementary primeval fear. I'm not talking about the neurosis of having a showdown with your boss. This is the fear of death. And, um, uh, and you know, he, he describes it vividly. Uh, and it's lovely to, to hear his account because not many masters go into their foibles and their weaknesses and how they transformed it. Not many masters do that. But he spent a whole, he, you know, in the book, there's a whole chapter um, uh, that night and what happened and and he was afraid he was deeply afraid and he was scared and he, he wanted to leg it and he, he actually sat there anyway to, to cut a long story short you know late into the night um, he, he actually felt footsteps you know he, he felt something was coming towards him he was so scared he couldn't even open his eyes but despite all that fear and obviously because of his tremendous training, I wouldn't recommend it to um, anybody glibly, just, you know, but because of his training, he stayed through it. And the way he describes this, I dared myself to practice. I dared myself. And, you know, fear was arising, but I will not give up. And eventually he had an insight. I'm going to die anyway. I might as well die today. Come on, let it happen. I'm going to die anyway. Let it happen today, so let it be. And, and, and he went on like this. And then suddenly, in an instant, it all vanished. Obviously, he was making it all up. It's all in our minds. You know, when, you, when you're in a dark room, in a sort of, and the wind is blowing, you know, in, a, in a sort of dilapidated, empty building, and there's nobody around, the mind does tend to play tricks on itself. But he dared to practice. He dared to sit through it. Because many people would have given up and, and ran for it or whatever. Or many people would go neurotic or whatever. But he, he and, and it really struck me quite powerfully, that, that thing. Just going to go off slightly and, and, and uh, mention a story from the Hindu tradition that, that I really like. I mean, some of you might have heard it before. But it, it's about 
the pitfalls of practice because sometimes we think we're doing the right thing and we're following the Buddha's way, but actually somehow, and quite often it's quite unconscious, you know, it's not necessarily done deliberately, but somehow we superimpose my way onto the Buddha's way, which is why it's very important to match practice and doctrine. And it, and it concerns a young acolyte, a monk, um, who's meditating on Krishna, and Krishna is one of the highest Hindu gods, and he goes off to the forest and he starts meditating on Krishna. Krishna, 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 and this goes on for years. When will you come and bless me? When will I receive your vision? Blah, blah, blah. Krishna, Krishna. And it goes on and on. And he's very sincere. He's there from you know dawn till dusk and you know he eats only nuts and berries he denies himself he's in solitude solitude he does all the right things and one day krishna up in the highest heaven thinks right right this this young man has really he's done well he's trained well it's about time maybe i should go and pay him a visit krishna does come but cheekily as a test he approaches him from the backside as this young man is meditating, Krishna, 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 Krishna. And Krishna comes up from behind him and taps him on the shoulder. And the monk explodes. How dare you? Can't you see I'm meditating? How could you? Off he goes into, flies into a rage after 10 years. Poor Krishna says, oh gosh, I better go back. <laughs> He's not in the right mood. <laughs> so let's be careful about that. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we actually sometimes deceive ourselves as well. We deceive ourselves. I, I remember uh, my dear old friend Trevor Leggett, who, who was a, uh, a great friend, uh, and actually on this 90th anniversary, it is, it is good to remember our close friend Trevor, who gave many years of his, of his life to, to the society. I remember a story he told me. Um, um, he, he knew... Um, uh, a close friend of his uh, lived in the countryside somewhere and he was a local parish member or something and on the local parish committee there was this elderly gentleman who had very strong opinions about various things and recently the committee wanted to change something I, I forget the technical details but I think um, they wanted to sort of um, introduce a, a, a new sort of playground or something like that and the committee as a whole wanted to do it but this rather uh, terse um, obstructive elderly gentleman uh, wasn't too keen on it and because he had been on the committee for centuries um, nobody really had the bottle to challenge him or, or they were but they were kind of you know sort of dilly dallying around him oh, don't you think maybe we should that kind of thing so this kind of went on for six months and actually, um, the local parish was suffering because, you know, um, the, there were more people coming in from the cities, there were more young mothers with children, and a playground was needed, and it was getting quite uh, difficult. Anyway, um, things got put into the long grass, and nothing, no decision was taken, and this elderly gentleman felt he had, he had achieved victory because... Everybody had listened to him, the elder statesman. Uh, he then gets quite ill, and um, he, he ends up in a nursing home. Um, he, he, I think he had an infection or something. And he then recovers, and he's in his nursing home. And Trevor's friend, who is the friend of this committee member, goes along to see him um, in the nursing home after his recovery, and says, uh, how are you, old boy? And he goes, oh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, I, 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 I have found my peace at long last. I have lived a good life. I have no quibbles. I have nothing left. I have done all my deeds. I can meet my maker in peace now. His friend, the committee member, played a stinker on him. He said, you do really, you know that thing, resolution, that uh, you so adamantly didn't want? Oh, I had to tell you this, old boy, but um, it's happening. We what? How could one, this man, you know, about 85 years old, lying in his bed peacefully, suddenly ex How what? There he was, a, a minute ago. I have found my peace. I have no quibbles. I'm going to meet, meet my maker. <laughs> anyway, we do these things with ourselves, you know. I'm a good Buddhist. I've been practicing for 25 years. 
I think I know a thing or two. Well, that's why it's so important to um, have that beginner's heart and, and always lower the head, always lower the head. You might learn from a 10-year-old. You might learn from a dog. You might learn from the wind. You might learn from a brook. It's, it's important to have that attitude because that is one of the pitfalls of advanced practice. You know, when we've done things for many years, we've read all the books, we've gone to so many retreats. Um, it's a very, very subtle kind of pitfall. It's a very dangerous, um, you know, spiritual grandiosity that sort of... So basically, we have replaced conventional materialism with spiritual materialism. And you see it, you, you see it an awful lot. And it's, it's a dangerous thing, you know, when a, when a person gets to that stage, um, he's actually beyond repair, uh, and he's very dangerous. These people we call bull men, and you see many cultish leaders, charismatic leaders, uh, and they sway people, and they lead many people up the wrong garden path. So we, we need to be careful about these things. Um, got, I'm going to mention a couple of other things. Um, I'm going to mention the story of the sixth patriarch in, in Chinese Zen, in, in, in Zen terminology. Um, his story is quite interesting because it has quite a few pointers to it in itself. And um, if we read about his life and his, um, and his instructions, there's a lot for us. And uh, the sixth patriarch, Hui Neng, was a, uh, supposedly a, an illiterate man from a backward part of China who um, used to live with his elderly mother and, and he, he looked after her selling uh, fire, fire, firewood. And one day he happened to hear a monk somewhere in passing. Um, he was going into a shop and there was a monk there and the monk was reciting the Diamond Sutra, which is one of the great uh, doctrinal sutras of the, the northern Mahayana tradition. And um, he had one or two lines, and, and it did something to him. It, it provided him with a tremendous insight. And he realized that there was some tremendous truth in it, and he wanted to follow up on that, and he wanted to pursue training. Um, his heart was, was um, activated, so to speak. He met the monk, found out um, you know, who his teacher was, and he made a long, arduous journey to meet the fifth patriarch, you know, whose disciple this monk was. Um, anyway, he, he, he goes around there, he's illiterate, um, uh, the, the fifth patriarch immediately realises his potential and he also realises that this man is very uneducated, he's from the villages, from backward China, um, the other established students in his monastery might get very jealous of him and whatever, so he actually pushed him into the background and said, you go and work in, in, in a, back in the sort of temple quarters pounding rice. I mean, he wasn't even allowed into the main monastic community. I mean, he, he was, but he was kind of an outsider doing lay manual jobs. And, you know, eventually the fifth patriarch felt the time for transmission to pass on uh, the transmission, you know, in Buddhism we have this transmission in all the traditions, master passes it on to his student and it's come down like that from the Buddha. So the time comes for the fifth patriarch to, to pass the transmission on and he sets a test. Um, he tells all his monks, um, he knows jolly well who, who the recipient is, <laughs> but nevertheless he does it formally and he sends it and he tells all the monks you know, to write a verse. In Buddhism, we're, we're, traditionally one is asked to, to write a brief verse expressing one's insight. And this verse is usually non-academic. It's usually straight from the heart and it reveals to, to the masters um, who has attained what level of insight. So the word spread around the monastery and um, um, everybody thought the head monk would get it because, you know, he, he was the head monk for many years and he was a very disciplined, learned monk, sincere. And so the head monk wrote this verse. Um, this mind is the body tree. Sorry, this body is the body tree. The mind a stand of mirror bright. Take heed to always keep it clean and let no dust upon it alight. So this body is the body tree. The mind a stand of mirror bright. Take heed to always keep it clean and let no dust upon it alight. So he's talking about the gradual training. 
This is the body tree. We, we polish ourselves, we cleanse ourselves, we train ourselves, and we don't allow any dust to obscure our eyes. Now, Hui Neng, in passing, he saw this verse. Uh, Hui Neng is the sixth patriarch, the illiterate one who was working in the distance, pounding rice for months, which is hard manual labor. He couldn't read or write, but he, he, he got another junior monk to read him that verse. And immediately he knew there was something missing. Whoever had composed this verse, there is something missing. So he asked for the other monk to write down his verse. And his verse goes, There is no Bodhi tree, nor stand of mirror bright. Since from the beginning all is void, where can the dust alight? So this is, this is quite non-dualistic. So technically, doctrinally, we would say the first verse is within the realm of duality. And Hui Neng's verse takes us to the transcendental non-dualistic realm, emptiness. And like most people, and to cut a long story short, obviously the Sixth Patriarch eventually got the transmission. That in itself is another story, which I won't go into. You can, you can read it up, but it's really interesting. But the point I want to bring out is, you know, when we first read it, I mean, the Sixth Patriarch is the winner, right? And we all kind of go along with him. Wow, there is no body tree, nor stand of mirror bright. Since from the beginning, always void, where can the dust alight? Sounds amazing. And, and it is. It's profound. But what we forget is one verse doesn't exist without the other. They're part of a pair. One cannot exist without the other. There is no winner. There is no loser. Yes, the sixth patriarch had the greater insight. But for us as trainees, we might like to side with the sixth patriarch and go for that one. But that one cannot exist without this one, just as light doesn't exist without dark. We might prefer the light and shun the darkness, but that's our folly. We, that's, that's living life half-heartedly, not wholeheartedly. And don't we do that in daily life? We hear something on the news and we jump to conclusions. We've just heard one side of it. We haven't, in politics, in, in, in whatever, we read something and immediately, we jump to conclusions. And for me, an example from my own life, I'll give you as one of my training tools. Um, certain things in the news really bug me personally. They upset me. I'm not going to go into what, but I'm sure you, we all have these things, our pet opinions and prejudices that really bug us, whatever it might be. I don't know, if you're a politician, it might be Europe, the European Union, or, or the economy, or this, or, or in the old days it was communism versus capitalism. Some ism tends to define us. Usually it's lots of isms that define us. But anyway, there's always one or two very powerful ism that sort of, given the chance, get us very het up and with a bee in our bonnet. And um, so in the old days, um, a few years ago, I would look at newspaper articles and things that are provocative and would stir me up. I'd really lay into it and then i will get all worked up about it and head up about it. Nowadays, I still go th scan through the newspaper, but I just flip through it, flip through it. Because as you recognise, most of it is other people's opinions. I mean, read the news by all means and find out the facts. There's a war going on there, but there's no need to go into all these different people's opinions because you know, their job is to sell papers and is to be as provocative and as sensational as possible and we get all worked up about it and then we talk about it and then we analyse it and then we think we know all about it and we just see it from one side. We're not seeing it from all round. So it's important to remember that as we sort of take in all this sensory data, you know, um, we're back to what I started off with. We're back to I and my opinions and my prejudices. And as I keep on saying, I've observed it in myself and the, many a master will concur. You know, 20, 30 years later, the same roots, they haven't been dealt with, they're still there. So it's important to be vigilant always. Right, I'm going to finish off now um, with, with just one final sort of thing, um, something that impresses me a lot. Um, it's a story from the Japanese Zen tradition, and for me, it, it 
to me it highlights what, what practice is all about and the fruits of practice. Um, it, consider, it concerns a, a samurai warrior who, after many years of internal struggle, decided, I can't be a samurai warrior anymore, I want to be a Zen monk. Now in those days, um, if you were a samurai warrior and you deserted your lord, it was the most dishonourable thing imaginable. And if other samurais found out, they'd kill you. Because to a samurai, that's the highest code. It's honour. Anyway, so he did this, uh, and obviously, uh, you know, he, he obviously had to do it secretly. And one day, he just rode off on his horse, left his liege lord, and went off to a distant mountain with a monastery, and there he trained for many, many years. And after many years, he was a seasoned monk now, and a, a truly developed practitioner. And he, as, as monks in those days did, after years of training, they used to go on pilgrimage. They used to go around the other monasteries throughout the land, meeting up with various masters, testing their insight, making sure that it was the, 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 the practice would hold together under all circumstances. So he, he start, set off on his travels. Um, soon into his travels, um, he was actually walking along and he bumped into another samurai warrior from, a, from his former days. And this other one, he recognised him immediately. And this other one was on, on, on horseback. And the other samurai's first reaction was one of intense disgust and hatred at this one for leaving their honourable code. And so he spat at him. Initially, he wanted to actually chop his head off with his sword. He actually unsheathed his sword, but realised he didn't want to sully his sword with the blood of such an inferior one. I'm not going to waste my precious sword on this one. So he spat at him, full, full face. And this monk, he simply did nothing. He simply moved the spittle out of his face and allowed the other one to go on his way. And at that moment, he, he suddenly realised what had happened to him. He said, a few years ago, when he was a samurai, he knows jolly well what he would have done. He would have got his sword out and there would have been a duel. But after these years of Zen training, he didn't have to do that. Something else had replaced it. And he just simply moved the spit from his face. And having realised the transformation in his heart, he actually turned round towards his temple monastery, mountain monastery, in the direction of that mountain, uh, and, he, and he did some profound prostrations. And he composed a verse on, on, in, on, immediately, because something had arisen at that moment. When tested severely, an insight had arisen. And it was a powerful, profound insight. And he realised that that moment that his life was completely transformed. So he did this lovely verse, uh, the mountain is the mountain, the way is the same as of old, verily what has changed is my own heart. And that's what this training is all about. Mountains are still mountains. You go out there, Victoria is still Victoria. There's all the mess up there. You'll bump into a few tramps, you'll see all kinds of shenanigans. The bills have to be paid. Mountains are mountains, the way is the same as of old. The heart, the human heart, is the same, east or west, then or now. We're all driven by some basic fires, the basic fires in Buddhism, wanting aversion, ignorance. But the training, it changes the attitude in the heart and as a result, hopefully, there's a bit more joy with both in our own lives and in those immediately around us, at the workplace, in the family, and, and that's all there is to it. It doesn't have to be something profound, I'm going to be the new messiah, I'm going to change the world, it's just a little thing, bit by bit, step by step. And of course it's very difficult, of course it's, you know, it's not easy and of course we fall into the same holes again and again 
But if we give ourselves into it, uh, and, 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 you know, th there's no need to get too sort of tripped up on guilt or, oh, I'm pathetic, oh gosh, I've been at it for so many years and I'm still making elementary blunders. <laughs> no, but just this, uh, just this one more step, just this one more step. And, 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 and I think the gratitude is very important, you know, the gratitude that, you know, we, we live in a time where, when, when, when yes, it, it's chaotic out there, but we, 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 we can choose to pick on what we like. We don't have to focus on all the negativities. I mean, the newspapers and journalists would tell you the world is about to explode any moment, but it isn't. There is joy out there. There are people doing wonderful things. We're all doing wonderful things, and we need to remind ourselves of that. That, you know, another step, another step, and with that comes the joy in ourselves. And I'm sure you'd all agree that when we give to others joyful service, it brings more joy in us. And you don't have to be particularly religious. People are giving to charity. People out there who are atheists are doing you know, amazing things and giving. So clearly they, there must be a reason for that. And that is joy. In the giving is the joy. And with that comes the gratitude. So even, you know, when it's not going so smoothly, even in the depth of our neurosis, if we can kind of stand back a little bit and, and, and just say, well, look, it's not really that bad, is it? Then we can get a bit closer to the Buddha's way and gradually, if we carry on like that, things do open up and, and you know, I'm not going to be as het up as I used to be years ago and things are a bit smoother and you have a bit more time for your friends and family and, and for ourselves and, and there's just simply more joy. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ajayan. It was a lovely talk. And if there's time now for, for questions from, from the audience. Yes, yes, yes. Sure. Okay. Um, brilliant. Thanks for the talk. Um, I love what you're saying about in certain situations, you remind every moment is kind of your meditation. So you say to yourself, what am I getting all hit up about? Then you go to the um, burial ground and you feel the fear and it's kind of, but it's only me, what am I scared of? Is there any point in your training when you're guided or influenced by the Buddha, by ancestors, by deities, by some kind of guide who could whisper that to you and say, there's nothing to be afraid of? Or is it like you said, when you're in the darkness, it's um, all just made up and there is nothing there? Everything is a tool, a deity, Buddhism is a tool. How you analyse it, how you describe it is up to you. But all this thing, even Buddhism is a temporary thing. It, do you know what I mean? The Buddha said it's a raft. It, it's, you know, don't get too sucked in by even Buddhism. So when you say a deity, somebody whispers, or me, what difference does it make? Well, what does it mean? Well, well what, what is important is staying with that state as far as one is one can possibly do and um, I for instance would tell you that I couldn't do it at this stage I probably couldn't stay all through the night um, um, you know, till, till dawn um, and it would be foolish to attempt to do things that one isn't ready for for instance if you sort of try to do um, a mega three-day retreat and you haven't had any previous practice it is not advisable do you see what I mean so your question you know is it a deity is it whatever these these are all temporary tools that that we're talking about the actual practice is giving myself into whatever is and on that there's not a lot else that can be said because when fully given into it's fully given into. There is no observer observing, commentating on the self, saying, am I doing this right? I mean, when you are in fear, I mean, it's fear. And fear is I. I am fear. And there is only fear. And depending on the level of training, depending on the 
amount of strength or whatever accrued accordingly the response would be do you see what I mean? not 100% um, okay. I was kind of think if you're in that before you got into the situation yeah. if you already had that deity with you mm -hmm. if you'd become that so you had that oneness then where would the fear be? because you'd see things as they are through Yes, yes, well, if, the, if your particular technique or whatever, and you're using a deity-guided thing, yes, as you're saying, then that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Um, that's why we have so many different traditions. I'm not quite sure what you're yeah, trying you to say. You seem very much on your own. I'm, I'm dealing with this, I've got to give myself a talking to, I've got to give, find the courage and the bravery yeah. to go through a situation. Instead of having that assistance. Yeah. Well, this has been addressed. I mean, in sort of Eastern philosophy, it's called the self power or the other power. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it's the same thing. Yeah. Ultimately, um, uh, if you look at the great Indian masters of the last century, there were two types. There was two. There was the great Ramana Maharshi, who is into self knowledge, and there was the sage Sri Ramakrishna, who was the devotee, who had a deity. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. It's it's all depending on your temperament. And the Buddha, being the master physician, he realized different people have different illnesses and different temperaments. Mm -hmm. Some are into whatever. I, I mean, I, I, I appeal to a deity. I mean, you know, if in pain, you know, I'm, oh my God, or whatever. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but in the final sense, um, you know, uh, w w one Indian master, Sri Ramakrishna, he, he said it quite beautifully. He said, imagine a lake with four different entrances, ghats, you know, the Indian steps into the lake. Um, one could be Tibetan Buddhism, one could be Christianity, one could be Zen, one could be anything, whatever deity, as long as it's done the right way. But when you're in the lake, in the middle of the water, it's all lake. It doesn't matter which entrance you went through. You're in the lake and and so whatever your tradition um, you know it, if it helps you if it's conducive then that's fine and that, that that's all there is yes I, I see what you, you're saying you know it is uh, and um, I, I think when, when we're under stress um, we, we, you know religiosity spirituality has various elements um, the Indians analyzed this they, they said karma yoga bhakti yoga jnana yoga uh, these are the three aspects so karma is duty so we can manifest our spirituality in our actions then there is devotion bhakti and there is jnana jnana is uh, what in buddhism we call prajna wisdom uh, so there's all these the different approaches and actually in any one individual um, all three are present you see what I mean? Uh, sometimes one manifests more so than others. And your sort of approach, appealing to the deity, you know, who helps, is a very valid, um, uh, you know, traditional approach. Okay, thanks very much. There, there's a nice story in, um, just to interject there, in one of Gunther's books about Kuan Yin. And he recalls a story of being somewhere in the mountains, walking along and it gets darker and darker and darker. This is a year, this is a, one of his associates and he, he in the mountain track on which he is very perilous and he has no choice but to walk on. And finally it's, it's almost completely dark, he really doesn't know where he is. At which point he suddenly has a, has a vision of Kuan Yin and Volokiteshva appearing to him a full picture of Kuan Yin and it leads him into a, to off the road and he finds himself in a, match in a cave and then the vision disperses and vanishes and, and in the morning he realised if he'd gone on he'd have fallen off but the question is where did that come from? You know, where did that image come from? If you're a Christian it possibly would have been St. Christopher you know but the, what it's really pointing at is that biologically, you know, there are senses which we're not really in touch with, you know, because it's all to do with me and my thoughts and my anxiety. But there is something in it that in us that knows, and all this practice is about activating that inborn, innate wisdom that's there all the time, and allowing it to help us, you know, at any occasion when it might need to. 
if we're totally self-preoccupied, we won't appear to us. And if we don't have had done some practice. Anyway, it's an aside. There's a question over there. I mean, yeah, I think you sort of answered it in the process. Just and my question was more about what's the sense of now Buddhism is changing and evolving towards that deification, which I think might be a, a bit of a danger. And but what you're telling me is that, from what you said, that most of all it depends on the person and the people coming in the group. Some might find that looking at the deity would be very helpful as long as it helps manage the, the fears, manages those animal instincts that we might have problems with in society, whereas others would probably not find that useful and would look at more of the practices, again, without that type of deity, because I, I mean, during the talk you, you mentioned a bit of the Lord Buddha in and, and, and that sense, and I come from a, a background where it's both a little bit Buddhist, well, even a little bit Christian, and then a little bit atheist. So you combine all that together, and as long as the practices help you, help those people manage their fears, live a more joyful life, then great. And what's your sense on that? As I said, these are all technical tools. How you get there is your prerogative. What appeals to you? What helps you? One has to be careful that, um, uh, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I think um, um, there, there was a controversy a few years ago with a particular uh, Tibetan Lama, uh, Lama Gelsen Gyatso, who started um, a, de a particular deity, uh, form of deity worship, and that saga sadly still continues. Um, but it's actually what you are worshipping to, what you are worshipping to. Um, in the initial stages, um, if, you, if you go to your typical you know, Asian country, uh, there are lots of devotees who, who actually worship deities. Hinduism, you know, is like that. And a lot of Buddhists can worship Buddha as a deity. But um, in the initial stages, it, it can all be very helpful. But ultimately, ultimately, these are just concepts we're building up. Even Buddhism is a grand edifice. And my own teacher, who trained in Japan for many years, Venerable Miyakyoni, um, she, you know, she said her greatest difficulty was in deconstructing this vast edifice called Buddhism. So we need to take it carefully. It's it's concepts, it's ideas. The you know um, uh, in, in the traditional Chinese way, the Tao can that can be named is not the real Tao. I mean, we talk about it, we have to talk about it, because that's the medium through which we communicate. But the heart is a different matter altogether. And and and, and as, as Desmond was just saying, that if we practice, depending on what your practice is, so if your practice is um, worshipping on Krishna or Vajrapani or, or Padrasambhava or Guanin or, or Christ or, or whatever, you may get such visions, you may suddenly, it will be activated. But the point Desmond made was spot on, is that there are other aspects to us that we are not fully in touch with. And that's quite obvious, yeah. I mean, you don't have to be a, a Buddhist or a scientist to work that out. You can see to, as, as we are growing up, uh, we have certain faculties when we are three years old. We have greater faculties. Uh, hopefully we have a bit more wisdom. Uh, and so things are changing. We, we are beginning to access parts of ourselves that we normally don't have access to. And things will happen. For instance, um, I mean, I, I like stories, and in my talks I mention these anecdotes. And one of the things is in certain tricky, perilous moments, suddenly up pops a story, or up pops. And it can come from Christ, it can come from Krishna, it can come from any tradition. You know, suddenly a story from Milrepa appears in my head, and, and oh gosh, he did this in this situation, and it guides me. Or a vision, as Desmond mentioned. So... Back to that lake and the four different entrances, whatever your route, as long as it's conducive. And as Buddha himself said to, uh, um, uh, uh, as he was walking along, you know, giving, he used to walk around northern central India, passing through different cities, villages. There was one tribe called the Kalamas who happened to be on the spiritual superhighway. Many an Indian master would pass along that route. And so this tribe, they're, they're very confused, you know, Lord Buddha. Um, I say Lord Buddha, what does the word Lord mean? I mean, does that mean anything? I mean, you can interpret what you like by me using the word Lord. It's just a figurative matter of speech. It doesn't mean much, actually. What goes on in my heart, um, 
you know, sometimes quite often we ourselves don't know, let alone what others think. But anyway, so the, the, the Buddha was walking along and, and, and the tribal elder asked him, he said, all you different guys are saying different things, you know, he's saying one thing, he's saying I should worship a deity, he's saying I should meditate on the self, blah, blah, blah. It's all a bit confusing. And the Buddha said, look, no, it's not. It's very simple. You put it into practice and see if it is conducive to peace of heart. See if it leads to the good life and you will know. And we all know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. We all know it's important to be kind, to consider others, not to be too greedy. These are quite basic things. So we have this you know, inherent ability. It's how we train that you know, basic thing, that basic human quality, to a point where we're not being heedless, we're not sort of hurting others, we're not sort of lacking in compassion, that kind of thing. So different techniques, and, 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 and that's why you know, Buddhism has all these different approaches, which is what's really wonderful about it. You know. And sometimes, yeah, Buddhists might get a bit fundamentalist and you know, terribly into their own schools, but I think one of the things in the West, a good thing, is actually Buddhists are more sort of um, broad spectrum, so to speak. You know, um, you know, we, we don't just associate with Zen Buddhists or Theravadins or or whatever. And, and there's also a lot of um, uh, Desmond. You you would know about this. There's a lot of dialogue, interfaith dialogue, and you know, and uh, what, what we're trying to say is let's not quibble about the differences. Let's 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 bow to the commonalities because. Differences there will be. Your personality is different from me. You know, you might like a different meal from me. That's okay. That's okay. But the bottom line is that you know that kindness of heart, that helping, that giving time. Do you know what I mean? That that's the important thing. Don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you. Very good question, very good question. Um, the problems arise, but they're not the same. The charge is not the same. So um, my newspaper example, yeah, I do it as a deliberate thing, you know. Um, um, you, you read something, oh, it's that one. No, nah, it's not a big deal. Or, um, you know, I've got to stay half an hour at work. I mean, I mean, normally for years on a Friday, I would always leave at four o'clock. Um, lately, things are getting tough in the NHS and you actually have to leave at half five or six. And when I first had to stay beyond four o'clock, it was like, <sighs> it was really <coughs> huffing and puffing. I'd come home. Um, I wasn't a pretty sight to the wife <coughs> just because I had to stay an extra half an hour at work. Right now, it's still irritating, you know, like I still want to get away by quarter to five. Yeah, uh, but sometimes I do have to stay an extra 15, 20 minutes or whatever. It's not that bad, you know. And, and more importantly, other things come in. Like, you know, I remind myself of that ox going round and round and round in that you know, horrible paddy field with snakes and mosquitoes, and it's not that bad. So, yes, the, the irritability does maybe, w can come up. Can we, shall we say it can come up? If it doesn't come up at all, well, that's wonderful. You know, but it can come up, but the practice does deal with the charge, and that's what it is about. It's you can imagine I as as a ball with all these spikes sticking out of it, and what the training does is kind of it evens those spikes out, so they don't hook anywhere anymore. So the ball rolls more smoothly. That's one way of looking at it. All right. The practice does work, otherwise we wouldn't be here. <laughs> What's the point of um, self-denial and restricting yourself and restraining yourself if you didn't get something out of it? Uh, and, you know, it, it's obviously gone on for thousands of years, so it clearly does work. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, suffering is the essence of Buddhism. You know, Buddha Tussa said, suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. Well, the practice involves suffering. 
but it's the right kind of suffering. The suffering that is driven by ignorance is the wrong kind of suffering. The suffering that is coming from the practice, because I'm restraining myself, I want to do things, you know, on a, on a nice sunny afternoon, you've finished work, it's terribly busy, um, you want to go to the park, but instead you have to come here for a group sitting. Well, that's painful, and it's happened to me. <laughs> uh, it is suffering, but actually then, when really given into, there's a joy. Ah, I did the right thing. I came for the sitting and I didn't go and distract myself in the park. And, and that's the subtle change you know, that happens. And, and that's all it is. It's, it's not some profound revelation, you know, I am Buddha or this or that. It's little, little things like that uh, that, that make, make life a bit more spacious and easier. And, and, and it catches, you know, it catches. You'll find your friends, your family, asking you and wanting your help and, and things are happier at home and the workplace, you're more popular, that kind of thing. You know. Any more? That? That brings us neatly to the end. Thank you very, very much. Pleasure, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have met you all.